and thank you to all of you for joining us today. It is a pleasure as always to welcome our returning attendees. And I should also mention that it's been wonderful to see some of you, some familiar names in person here in Jordanville over the past several weeks. We've had people who have found out about the museum as a result of our lectures and have come and visited us in person. Uh, so yes, our museum is open. Our current exhibition on Russian sacred art is open until December 31st, and there is the opportunity to tour the exhibition as well as the church of the Holy Trinity Monastery. So if you uh, plan to travel here, please stop by uh, in, in, the, in the area um, and uh, sign up for a tour, and we'd love to meet you in person. Of course, I extend a warm welcome to everybody who is joining us for the first time, and I hope that this will not be the last time. I hope this is the first of many, and that you will share with your friends uh, the wonderful lectures that we've had uh, both in the past and will be coming will be having in the future. Um, I would also like to thank all of our generous supporters who are making this pro uh, free progr programming possible, and especially those donors who uh, made a gift leading up to this second Saturday lecture. And for those of us, uh, for those of you who would like to join those 18 generous donors, um, Hannah is going to put a link to a donation page in the chat box. So at any point during the program, I invite you to go to our website uh, to make a donation, whether it's $10, $50, $100, um, every dollar goes towards supporting programs like this. Now, um, as probably most of you know, we just sent 50 objects from our collection to Russia, to the museum at Tsarskoye Silo. These objects and the theme of the exhibition is what um, inspired us to talk about Cossacks today and to invite Brian Beck as our speaker today. Um, it is a tremendous honor and privilege for our museum to be collaborating with one of the world, world's most uh, renowned uh, palace uh, museums and collections in Russia. And uh, this is a huge occasion for us, for our museum, as well as for, for the Russian museums, because many of the objects that we sent um, have not been in Russia since 1917. So they are returning for a, uh, for a visit for the first time in over 100 years. Also, I should mention that Tsarskoye Silo has not had um, loans from an American institution for nearly two decades. So again, this is a very important milestone for our museum, and it is our mission to share our collections with ma as many people as possible. The topic of the exhibition is the elite military unit, the um, escort the, of His Imperial Majesty, Tsarsky Convoy, Imperatorsky Convoy. Um, and this is a, a landmark exhibition, and we're very proud to be part of this. Um, so now uh, I will introduce our uh, speaker today, um, who is not only a um, uh, today's speaker, but also I'm glad to, uh, to consider uh, Brian as a personal friend and as a friend of the museum. Um, I'm especially pleased to welcome today's speaker because he has visited our museum on numerous occasions and has conducted research here. Professor Brian Beck um, has a doctorate in history from Harvard University. Brian teaches Russian and Soviet history at DePaul University in Chicago. He is the author of Imperial Boundaries, Cossack Communities and Empire Building in the Age of Peter the Great, and Stalin's Scribe, Literature, Ambition and Survival, The Life of Mikhail Sholokhov, which was a shortlist finalist uh, for the Pushkin Prize for the best nonfiction writing about Russia. So thank you all uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Brian, for joining us. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, just a couple of words. Um, Michael asked me to give this lecture in connection with the exhibition. So um, I'm gonna be providing a, a kind of large overview of Cossack history. And I'm also going to be highlighting uh, objects in the collection, some objects that have never been seen before. Um, so this, this comes with a couple of caveats. First of all, um, if you know nothing about Cossack history, you'll get a brief, very broad introduction. Um, if you are a connoisseur of Cossack history, there'll be a, a lot that will be familiar to you and one or two points that hopefully will pique your attention and make you say, aha, 
if your great grandfather was a Cossack, I'm not gonna talk about him. Um, I only have so much time. And so uh, I'm gonna focus on broad, large processes rather than any individual personalities. Um, and I'm going to provide a kind of idiosyncratic overview. The, the lecture is titled From Border Guards to Bodyguards. Uh, border Guards is a little bit of a misnomer. I'll talk about frontier brotherhood, then borders being created. And bodyguards I'll be emphasizing in connection with the exhibition, that is the, the Cossacks uh, from the Kuban region and Terek region were, had the honor of being selected, had the honor of being the best of the best who guarded the imperial family uh, between 1811 and 1917, actually a little bit earlier than 1811. Um, so I'll, I'll pay a little more attention to the bodyguard side precisely because the museum has sent um, a number of objects to this groundbreaking expedition exhibition on um, His Majesty's own imperial convoy. So it'll be a little bit idiosyncratic in that regard. So when I ask my undergraduates, I've been teaching now, uh, gosh, almost 20 years. Uh, when I used to ask them in the 90s, when I say the word Cossack or Kazakh, what comes to mind, I used to get a real answer. And the real answer used to be something like a man on horseback or a sword or a fighter or a warrior. Now I ask them today and they, they kind of scratch their heads and one or two might say something about toxic masculinity, but, but essentially, very few Americans, unless in seventh grade, they studied uh, that short story, The Most Dangerous Game, in which the evil villain is a Kazakh general, Zaroff, who hunts human beings. They simply don't know what it is. And so I've kind of developed a, a broad overview for talking about um, Kazakhs and their role in Imperial Russian history in kind of large, broad strokes. And so some of that is what you'll be hearing today. So when you say Cossacks to an American audience, uh, usually their impressions are formed from popular culture. And here I'm showing an object from the museum. It's a, it's a movie poster for a film made in Hollywood in the 1928 uh, starring John Gilbert called The Cossacks, which kind of plays on a lot of stereotypes, exotic, colorful figures, wielding swords, riding horses, dressed in kind of fantastic over the top costumes. And for much of the 20th century, this was the, the, the image that would have formed in people's minds if you said Cossack. And this, this plays on, on uh, both the Cossacks who were visible and who had representation in the United States. And I'll talk about that at the end of my lecture, as well as Russia's, I consider it one of Imperial Russia's greatest paintings. And that of course is Ilya Repin's painting of the Zaporozhian Cossacks writing a letter to the Turkish Sultan. Now, if you're paying careful attention and if you've been to St. Petersburg and you've seen the painting, you know that I'm not showing the canonical version, I'm showing a, a version that's in a different museum in Ukraine, but it, it depicts the original world of Cossacks as a kind of freebooting frontier military brotherhood that formed in the steppe in that great grassland prairie uh, to the south of the Russian Empire. And I'll, I'll return to the canonical image in just a few seconds. So we begin our story in the steppe. We begin our story with that great, vast sea of grass, that open prairie, tall grass steppe that stretches from Hungary and Central Europe all the way to China uh, across Eurasia. And it's in the areas north of the Black Sea that we first start to see um, Cossacks starting to arise as a kind of frontier group on the edges of the steppe. Now, Kazakh in Turkish simply means an individual who's left the confines of their own society or their own tribe who's gone alone, someone going alone or who's separated themselves, a kind of freebooter or free individual. And from the 15th century in areas along the northern shores of the Black Sea, we start hearing about Kazakhs in these sources. And in almost every case, these are freebooting individuals, not subject to any government, not subject to any tribe, military entrepreneurs, raiders, traders who show up in the settlements along the Black Sea. So in this great grassland prairie, communities distinct from the nomadic, pastoralist populations that traditionally inhabit the steppe, 
and distinct from the agriculturalist Slavic populations up in what's today's Russia and Ukraine are starting to form in the steppe. That is small groups of individuals, um, small groups of men forming male brotherhoods to fish, um, to harvest whatever furs or animals that are available in the steppe, to raid against the other side. So the beginning of the process is in the 15th century. It's not until the 16th century that the light goes on in terms of sources that the Russian state starts hiring these Cossacks for services. That is, as embassies are sent from Moscow to Istanbul, and as these embassies have to cross the steppe in order to get to the Black Sea, in order to get on boats, uh, the Russian Tsars start to hire these Cossacks as guards for these embassies. So a kind of semi-official relationship starts in which they provide subsidies, subsidies in the form of money, subsidies in the form of weapons, uh, guns, gunpowder, subsidies in the form of other products that these freebooting military brotherhoods might want. Uh, that the Russian government starts to get involved with them. So a semi-official relationship starts to develop in the 16th century out of the need of diplomacy. Essentially, and hopefully the next slide will cooperate, um, these early Cossacks were multi-ethnic military brotherhoods. And, and the general rule was anyone who's willing to adopt to their lifestyle is welcome. So they welcome all comers uh, and they tend to be multi-ethnic. Um, we don't know exactly what their ethnic composition was, but we know that there are individuals uh, from the Slavic societies, uh, Russians, Ukrainians. We know that there are uh, Greeks who join these early Cossack groups. We know that there are individuals from the Caucasus. So it's a kind of multi-ethnic group formed for the purpose of pursuing a life free from the constraints of government, free from the constraints of uh, agriculture, free from the constraints of taxation and who live together in a regime of equality uh, and self-government. So the, the, these early communities are probably more akin to pirate communities, individuals who come together for common purpose, that common purpose being raiding or plundering, individuals who come together to assert a radical vision of equality, all members of the community are equal, all are part of a brotherhood, all participate in communal decision-making, a kind of rough and tumble democracy. I call it rough and tumble democracy because if they, if, if the Brotherhood didn't like what you said, they might just as they might uh, not simply shout you down, but might might beat you up. So it's a kind of rough and tumble democracy, um, and they they divide all spoils equally. So if they go on a raid, whether by land or by sea. And these early Cossack communities fairly quickly take to swift boats and start raiding the river networks and start raiding uh, across the Black Sea as well. Uh, I like to call them amphibious warriors, but that often confuses my undergraduates who picture them as amphibian warriors, but no, they don't have green skin. Uh, they, they operate by land and sea. These early Cossacks um, come together um, and share the spoils of any raid that they commit. Um, and so they live a life of raiding, um, of ransoming. Ransoming is often more valuable economically than trade, taking someone who's prominent or elite from the other side, from Turkish society or Crimean Tatar society or one of the Caucasian groups, and then ransoming back to their home culture at an elevated uh, rate. So they, they live a life of raiding, trading, and plundering. Uh, we don't know exactly what they look like, and I'm showing here Repin's version from 1891 of the canonical painting. Uh, Repin tried to reconstruct an image of what those early Cossacks look like. These are 17th century Cossacks, but they, they're essentially wearing whatever they can get their hands on. And so some of the styles are characteristic of Slavic culture. Some of the styles are characteristic of Eastern culture. Some of the objects you see could come from a, a Persian bazaar. So they, 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 they live, a, their, their visual appearance is very eclectic. Uh, all of that changes as they start to enter into uh, more um, regular relationships with the Russian empire. And I'm not gonna talk about the Cossacks in Ukraine. I'll only bring them into the story when I talk about Catherine the Great in just a few minutes. Um, 
I put together two maps here showing the, um, the step in the small map and where the Cossack hosts were formed, that pink section in the map below. And you see a big correlation between where these Cossacks arose and the, the strategic edges of the step. Uh, so in the North Caucasus as a buffer, along the areas um, near the Urals Mountains in the Arenburg region, uh, Western Siberia, um, so th there's a high correlation between the, the geography of the steppe and advantageous strategic areas and where these societies arise. Um, and I'm, I've given you the, the various Cossack hosts that were brought into the imperial system, the earliest, the Don Cossack host, 1570, the latest, uh, those founded in the Far East in the mid 19th century. Uh, but this is an ongoing imperial phenomenon, wherever the Russian Empire needs men who know how to fight. Whenever men, whenever the Russian Empire needs military servitors who punch above their weight in effectiveness, one Cossack is militarily more effective than a handful of peasant recruits. Wherever military manpower is needed is where these Cossack hosts are patronized by the government. So some of them arose organically. Uh, in the 16th century, others arose through imperial action in the 18th and 19th century of the Russian government actually moving, transplanting, colonizing Cossacks from this North Black Sea area, moving them to other parts of the empire. I'm going to keep most of the focus on this area around the Black Sea, uh, simply because it's more germane to our story and particularly that bodyguard element that we'll be getting to in just a few minutes. Uh, in my book on imperial boundaries, um, I, saw, I, I studied the transition of the Cossacks from a military frontier brotherhood into a closed military caste. That is, that the process of them transforming from open communities who will accept anyone to closed communities dedicated to service to the Russian Empire. And this comes both with um, the awarding of a number of privileges, that is the Cossacks because of their privileged status as servants of the Tsar, servants of the Romanov dynasty had more rights and privileges than the average Russian. They had more um, ability to govern themselves uh, than the average Russian villager had. So they occupy a privileged position within the Russian empire. And yet it comes with the burden of lifetime service. That is, as these, these Cossacks are brought into the Russian empire, one of the burdens of Cossack service is that they're born to serve and it's a lifetime of service. Uh, that changes as the imperial period goes on, but in theory, um, a Cossack can plan to spend, um, his, uh, can plan to spend his whole life either in active service or in reserve or as an elder, helping the system function uh, at the local level. So I, I, I say lifetime of service because the elders play a big role in training young Cossacks to serve. So in a sense that the life of service is never done. Uh, when I published my book, I chose this painting by Joseph Brandt, a Polish painter who worked in the 1880s and 1890s because it signifies that period of transition from a kind of boundless world of step raiding, a boundless world of Cossacks going out on long raids uh, into nomadic areas to a world that was, was a world of borders. And it's under Peter that borders, Peter the Great, Peter the First, um, who rules from 7, 1694 to 1725, uh, that the Cossacks are pressed into a regime of borders. They have to carry government documents. They're not allowed to raid. Uh, they have to follow orders. They're sent out of their home territories to remote parts of the empire for the first time. Uh, they're actually forced to relocate at imperial will or imperial whim. So the, the beginnings of this uh, incorporating the Cossacks into the Russian empire and making them a tool of service of the Tsar happens during the reign of Peter I. Now, um, I'm on record as saying, I don't think Peter was very great. Um, that's mainly because the Cossacks didn't think he was very great. They raised a rebellion. Um, the Don Cossacks raised a rebellion. Um, a large number of them were killed, but also it was a Cossack civil war. That is, there was a loyal group who wants to pursue this government service. 
There was a freebooting group who didn't want to. They raise a rebellion under Bolivin um, and it's brutally suppressed, but Peter in his generosity decides to recreate the Cossacks rather than destroy them. And so it's the beginning of a more imperial uh, Cossack um, service with leaders connected to the Russian government, with leaders who are pursuing alliances with St. Petersburg, uh, ordinary Cossacks, no longer allowed to accept people into their communities, no longer allowed to marry people from outside of the region. So it's the beginning of a closing. Uh, and this is why the Cossacks had their own distinct identity, even though they were Russian speaking, and even though they were among the most loyal servitors of the Russian empire, they, will, they would often say, well, we're not Russians. And what they meant by that is they were not Russian in the sense that they were not subject to serfdom. They were not Russian in the sense that they were not living under the government alcohol monopoly. They were not Russian in the sense that they still retained local autonomy to elect their leaders. They were not Russian in the sense that they lived under their own laws or adapted imperial versions of their own laws. So they were the most dedicated servants of the Russian empire, but often if you ask them, are you Russian? For them, Russian meant a different social regime associated with serfdom. Now under Peter, uh, there's a beginning of a process of forming the Cossacks into more regular uh, cavalry units for the Russian military and Peter starts to send them outside of their territory. Uh, so they play a, a outsized role in the Great Northern War. And so it's the beginning of a more imperial range, arrangement. When, wherever military man force is needed, he sends these Cossacks. And we get, start to get some of the first images. These are 18th century images of how these Cossacks might have looked. Um, note that there, there's something more like a uniform emerging. Now, I'm not gonna say, any, I'm not gonna say much about uniform because there are uniform sticklers. There are people who spend their whole lives studying Cossack uniforms and the differences between, I'm not going to get into that, but, but in the period I studied in my first book, there was no such thing as a uniform. However, there was a, a cap which only Cossacks were allowed to wear in Russia, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons you knew you were dealing with a Cossack and not, and that's represented here. Uh, and there were elements of a distinct form of clothing, clothing emerging. It's not until the mid 18th century that the government comes in and starts standardizing Cossack uniforms. So this is right on the cusp of that period. It also starts uh, standardizing Cossack symbols. And I wanna, wanna stop for just a moment. This is one of the first objects from the museum that we'll see in today's talk. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of ceremonial plaque representing the first government issued seal, the seal that you put on official documents, the seal that you put on official paperwork. So the first government issued seal the seal that went on personal identity documents, uh, which was created at the behest of Peter I. And it represents a Cossack sitting on a barrel naked. And you can see that pretty well in this image. Um, and there were several legends that arose about this particular image. I'm giving you on the left, the actual seal itself. So the, the, the seal that would be imprinted on documents. Um, and on the right, we have the museum plaque, which is a kind of representation of it, a much later representation um, in which the individual is sitting on the barrel. Now it's kind of strange, uh, someone sitting naked on the barrel and, and legend has it that Peter, sorry, Peter encounters a Cossack sitting naked on a barrel. And he says, what happened to your clothes? And the Cossack says, well, I, I needed some drinks. So I, I sold them so that I could continue drinking. And Peter says, you know, well, well why, didn't, why do you still have a weapon then? Why do you still have a rifle? And the Cossack says, well, uh, as long as I have a rifle, I can both serve you and get new clothes. So it was seen as a kind of symbol of the Cossack uh, bravery and willingness to, to, to risk all in service to the Tsar and his endeavor. Now, that's not exactly what really happened with the seal. Uh, we know from a document from 1704 that it was a symbol of Cossack bravery. It was not a Cossack sitting naked on a barrel of beer or a barrel of vodka. It was a, bat, it was a Cossack sitting naked on a barrel of gunpowder smoking a pipe. And you see that a little better in the image on the, 11, uh, on the, on the left. A Cossack so brave that, that he's willing to sit on a, literally on a powder keg uh, and calmly smoke a pipe. And supposedly this is what Peter witnessed. 
uh, and was so impressed by the, the, the bravery and audacity of this act that he made this the official seal of the Don host. Um, I'm gonna move forward. I'm not gonna talk about all those rulers between Catherine, all of those palace coups, all of the, the infants on the throne for a short period of time, uh, the, the intrigue involved. What's important for our purposes is that Catherine the second, Catherine the Great comes to power through one of several palace coups in the 18th century. Uh, and she's indebted to the palace guards for coming to power, for switching allegiances to her. And it's under Catherine, possibly as a, as a counterbalance to the imperial guards, which had been kingmakers for much of the 18th century, uh, that Cossacks start to be used in some form of imperial bodyguard, some form of imperial escort. Um, we know that, that the earliest Cossacks who serve in this role tend to be recruited by her lover and favorite, Grigory Patyomkin. So I'm showing you with Catherine, Catherine and Patyomkin here. And Catherine is responsible for moving Cossacks from closing frontiers in Ukraine. So from the Dnieper region and the areas where the Russians had just fought wars with the Tur Turks north um, west of the Black Sea down to the Kuban region. So along the Kuban River in the North Caucasus um, in the late 1780s, Patyomkin is putting these former Zaporozhans together. Uh, in the early 1790s, they're petitioning at court for new lands in the Caucasus. And Catherine, after Patyomkin's uh, death, gives her approval for this. So Cossacks move from closing frontiers in Ukraine to opening frontiers in the, Cossack, in, in the Caucasus. And that becomes the basis of the group that, that comes to be called the Kuban Cossacks, one of the two groups who comprise uh, the imperial escort or the kind of uh, that Michael mentioned. The other group is the Terek Cossacks, a group whose origins go back uh, to the mid 16th century uh, in the Caucasus um, who had formed an alliance and relationship with the Russian government uh, that went back to the 16th century. They were gradually augmented and supported in the 18th century and who received the honor, even though one of the, they're one of the smallest groups territorially will also receive the honor of sending men to be a part of the Imperial bodyguard and the Imperial escort. So the, those two become the core of the future Imperial escort. Uh, just to show that history proceeds unevenly, there's a group of Cossacks called the Chuguyev Cossacks who no one talks about today because they went extinct in the 18th century. They were decommissioned uh, in the 19th century. They're, 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 they, they simply have no modern successors, but they were the original Cossacks at court invited by Patyomkin in 1774. And you, you'll notice some continuities between uh, their dress and the dress of the Imperial escort as it emerges. So uh, around 1774, these, these Cossacks start to be brought in as palace guards. Um, and we know that Patyomkin has a hand in it and he's looking not simply for the best of the best and these imperial escorts are the best of the best. They're selected by their communities for being the bravest, the strongest, having the best writing skills, but they're also the best looking. And, and we have degree, decrees in Patyomkin's own hand where he says, send good looking guys with good looking horses who are tall. So they also had to have an impressive appearance um, to, to, to appear before the eyes of the Tsar. Um, this is the more traditional image that is the, the imperial escort, uh, the Cossack bodyguards who surround the emperor. Um, starting in the, the, the 19th century, the official date of founding is 1811, but as I've said, you can trace a kind of line back to 1774. Um, it's under Alexander I, um, who reigned from 1801 to 1825, that um, these imperial, imperial bodyguards um, start to be um, more regularized. They start to have a more ceremonial and celebrated position at court. And if we look at it as the best of the best, um, during this period, 1801, um, there are about 100,000 men eligible for Cossack service. Of those 100,000 men, only about 400 will be considered for the imperial escort. So we're talking about a very serious process of selection in which at the local level, um, individuals are, are evaluated for their skills, their writing skills, their bravery. Uh, 
for their appearance, uh, and eventually for their singing skills. That is, this would become, as they're marching, as they're accompanying the Tsar as his escort, they would often be singing rousing martial songs. So by the 19th century, singing becomes a qualification as well, uh, remarkably. Um, this is how they come to appear in the early 19th century. And, and so you can see some kind of continuities in experience. Um, and if you've been to St. Petersburg, and if you've been to any of the wonderful palaces, if you've been to Catherine's Palace, or if you've been to um, Peterhof, you know that, that there are beautiful gardens. So you have to imagine guys like these uh, prowling the perimeter, the perimeter of the palace gardens, guys like these standing at the major audience rooms of the palace individuals forming the changed honor guard that, that, that guards has guard posts at various entry points and key points to the palace complex. So they provide um, the inner layer of security uh, for the royal family um, starting in the 19th century. Uh, and as a result, all sorts of traditions arise as a result of this because of their proximity to the royal family. That is, they're a part of the royal household and often given access to the royal household that, that, that even the highest ranking officials of the empire wouldn't have. And I'll mention an example of that in just a few minutes. Um, they truly proved their mettle to the Russian empire during the Napoleonic invasion of Russia uh, in 1812. And I'm showing another object from the collection, uh, a German engraving um, that demonstrates uh, uh, a Cossack uh, and a field blacksmith. So the, the Cossack is on the horse uh, facing backwards. It's a field smithery, but it's the beginning of a whole episode in European art of representing Cossacks. There's a kind of man crush of Cossacks that arises in European art during the Napoleonic Wars. And we literally get dozens and dozens of European artists amazed by the agility of the Cossack cavalry starting to depict Cossacks on engravings and paintings. And so this is one from the museum's collection from 1818 by a German artist. Here's another uh, by a French artist uh, named Carl Vernet from 1817. It's a uh, cavalry duel between a French hussar on the left and the Russian Cossack of the Imperial escort on the right. Uh, I don't know who won. Uh, in fact, the artist doesn't tell us, but it's symbolic of the, the large conflict unfolding on the European continent between Napoleon and Alexander I. Um, during the war, um, there were various episodes in which Cossacks provided key military, key military manpower at the key moment. In the interest of time, I won't have opportunity to talk about those, but at every stage of the conflict with Napoleon, Cossacks play a crucial role, whether it be uh, near Smolensk when the goal was to bog down Napoleon's forces and give time for Russian reserves to mobilize to defend Moscow, uh, whether it be in, uh, in Germany, uh, defeating along with the allies Napoleon's forces, whether it would be in Paris itself. And there's all sorts of images of Cossacks in Paris after the Russian army successfully gets there. What I'm showing you here is a, a painting by Karl Rechlin called Charge of the Imperial Escort Guards. And it's a particularly important incident in 1813 near Leipzig, where uh, Napoleon um, is, uh, is leading a frontal attack on the Allied forces. Um, Alexander I and uh, Frederick William, or is, it, or is it William Frederick? All the Prussian Tsars are either Frederick William or William Frederick. Um, are in danger from this frontal assault and the Imperial Guards decides on a, decide upon a brave uh, frontal attack and then harassing in the rear of this attacking force captured here on the painting. Um, so they could claim with some degree of uh, verity that uh, on one day they saved the life of two emperors. Um, and that was a, a particularly proud moment for them. Um, the problem with proud moments is what comes afterwards. And it's really in the wake of the War of 1812 uh, and the victory that, that ordinary Russians, because they played such a big role in the partisan warfare, they played a, such a big role in harassing and defeating that army of 600,000 men that Napoleon brought into Russia and that was devastated, um, dragging back um, only a small fraction of what he brought in. Uh, that, that ordinary Russians start demanding, asking for a larger share 
uh, of political participation. And obviously for the Cossacks, this is something of a, a uh, something of a problem simply because their privileges, their privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the population starts coming into question. I'm showing you here just another of these European works, Cossacks who've made it, made their way all the way to Central Europe and are parading through one of the towns. Uh, I think it's Hamburg. So the question of the century, I'm showing you a propaganda poster from the Civil War era, but I think it's the question of the 19th century. Cossack, who are you with? Are you with us or are you with them? And with us in this case means ordinary Russians, ordinary Russian peasants who've experienced serfdom, ordinary Russian peasants who've lived with various restrictions on their lives and activities. Are the Cossacks going to side with ordinary Russians and embrace them as brothers, or are they going to continue to maintain their particular identity, their privileged position relative to the dynasty? And so there is a Cossack question unfolding on the political level, that is, will the Cossacks agree to share civil rights with ordinary Russians, or will they continue to defend the dynasty and their privileged position, their privileged, privileged relationship to it? There's also tech, a technological question. Uh, this only comes up towards the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century with the mechanization of warfare, with the increasing um, use of machines. Can cavalry warriors, warriors who are renowned for their horsemanship, for their cavalry skills, survive under new conditions. So there are two kind of existential questions that the Cossacks are facing. There's another existential question and that is the fate of the dynasty. If the Cossacks are so closely connected to the dynasty, what happens if the dynasty is overthrown? What happens if the Romanov family goes away? The Cossacks have tied their fate utterly and completely with the Romanovs. What if the dynasty goes away? And here I'm showing you an example um, Two images, one here and one here from the execution, uh, the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. Um, you'll see, if you look at the image I'm showing in the bottom left corner, you'll see one of his Terek Cossack bodyguards being dragged away, uh, killed during the bomb plot. So uh, people's will organized the bomb, the throwing of bombs at the Tsar's carriage in St. Petersburg. This has a couple of implications. For our imperial convoy, it means that they take on a more ceremonial role. The secret police get a more active role in guarding the Tsar. The imperial convoy are still around the Tsar, but much of the actual vigilance is outsourced to a modern emerging police force. So the, the imperial bodyguard continues its ceremonial roles, but the actual guarding of the royal family after uh, Alexander is assassinated starts to be taken on by uh, modern police officials. In addition, it raises the question of, um, is St. Petersburg safe for the royal family? And the Tsars after Alexander II tend to spend increasing amounts of time outside of St. Petersburg. And so there's a move towards those palaces far removed from the city, far removed from urban unrest, far removed from the crowds and the manipulation of the crowds so there's a shift to outside of St. Petersburg. Um, and I want to just mention that, that as crowds start to become a force, as large numbers of people take to the streets, one of the functions that the Cossacks are, that is imposed upon the Cossacks is a police function. That is to uh, take care of uh, pushing demonstrators back from government buildings, to route illegal demonstrations. And so, Part of their reputation in the West comes from this role of um, dispersing street demonstrations, as well as the roles that they took, the, 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 the role that they took part in anti-Jewish pogroms, anti-Jewish sporadic acts of violence committed increasingly after the assassination of Alexander II. So um, this is part of the story. Uh, th their role is as kind of mounted policemen in urban areas to control crowds. Obviously on their horses, they can move crowds, maneuver crowds. So they, they play a disproportionate role in suppressing urban unrest. And this earns them the ire of the revolutionaries. That's one of the reasons why Lenin, Trotsky and co hated the Cossacks so much and embarked on a policy of de after the revolution is successful. 
Now this brings us to the last Tsar and the last Tsar had a special relationship with the Cossacks and a special relationship with his imperial convoys. So I'll be talking about Nicholas II um, who reigned until 1917. Uh, and we, we know his special relationship partly from the fact, another object from the museum, he represented himself in the dress of his imperial escort. That is, he, he bonded with these escorts, uh, bodyguards, lifeguards, ceremonial companions so much that he and his son were both represented in the uniform of the imperial escort. Uh, he participates in a number of personal ceremonies. What we're witnessing here is a ceremony in which the royal family is uh, presenting um, weapons, uh, sabers to members of the imperial escort. Uh, so they've arrayed. Uh, they're actually in front of the Catherine's Palace outside the city of St. Petersburg where the family lived uh, much of the time. It's a kind of occasion in which they are directly being uh, rewarded for their personal service to him and guarding him. Uh, he builds them a new barracks. It's a barracks in the old Russian style. Uh, he starts building it um, in uh, just on the eve of World War I. It's completed just during the beginning stages of World War I. So the great irony is this great structure was built to help house the Imperial escort. Uh, the Imperial bodyguards, and uh, they didn't get to spend much time there. Um, near Tsarske Selo, uh, the building is still there. It's an agrarian university. university. It was bombed so much by the university, by the Germans, uh, that you wouldn't be able to tell what it is if you actually went there today. Uh, here's another um, ceremonial occasion in which Nicholas is greeting and interacting with uh, these Cossacks of his bodyguard. Um, I think these are two of his daughters. There may be a Romanov expert in the audience who will tell us which of them they are. Um, but it, it's, an, it's another sign of that close bond between the royal family and these Cossack guards. And here, this, this was one of the most difficult days of Nicholas's rule. Um, it was the first Easter that he spent away from his family in 1916 at Mogilev at the military headquarters. And here he's seen uh, in exchanging the traditional Easter kiss with members of his guard. Um, and so uh, it's funny, Nicholas records in his diary, uh, on that day, I had to kiss 860 different individuals. Uh, now, given that the Easter, the, the Easter tradition requires three kisses exchanged, multiply that number and you get a quite daunting number. Um, but this is also the last um, Easter that he will spend uh, as Tsar and as ruler of all of Russia. So it's the, this 1916 image is tinged with a little bit of sadness, which obviously gets us towards the, the next spring when the revolution comes um, and the, the pushing the story a little bit further. Uh, I want to highlight here that this is uh, an individual named Nikolai Galushin, a member of the Imperial Guard who donated um, some important items to the museum. Um, and he's represented here both during World War I and as an older man, I believe in 1961, keeper of the tradition, keeper of the memory of uh, this Imperial Guard alive. Um, and he was also, uh, I'll just use, my next book is gonna be about disinformation. So I'll talk about a small piece of disinformation. Uh, he spent a lar large portion of his life re re refuting the disinformation spread on March 1st, 1917, that the Imperial bodyguard surrendered to the Duma, that, that the Imperial bodyguard all abandoned Nicholas and went over. It was complete fake news. There, there was no factual reality behind it, and yet it shaped history. It shaped history in terms of perceptions in St. Petersburg, that if even the most loyal guards of the Tsar have surrendered, there's no one left to fight for him. So it played a role in shaping public opinion. It played a minor role in Nicholas's thought process about whether to resign or whether not to resign. Uh, he actually had true information uh, from the individuals, the part of the guard that was traveling with him at the time that, that this was not true. So it, it didn't exactly shape his decision to abdicate, but it's very interesting that one day after this fake news, it's over. Nicholas abdicates. And so um, I want to use this image, which is an image, I'm, I'm getting to the end of my time here, um, an image of, of these uh, imperial 
escort members in exile keeping their traditions, which includes their banners. So one of the banners in the collection of the museum, uh, another one as well. Um, this was actually saved from one of the Tsar's suburban palaces uh, during the February Revolution because when Kerensky ordered all regalia collected for the purposes of taking off the imperial eagles, this was, was still inside the palace. And so they snuck into the palace, stole their own banners and took them for safekeeping. And so that explains one of the reasons why we can see it today. It wasn't handed over to Kerensky. Um, and then we have the Civil War. This is a kind of satirical map of the Civil War in 1919. The forces arrayed against the Bolsheviks. You see in the middle two kind of confused figures. That's Lenin and Trotsky with their suitcases packed. It looks as if counter-revolution, all these white armies are converging on Moscow. And so you see the Cossacks down near the Black Sea getting weapons and, and funds and materials from their allies. You see the Americans, the guy with the American flag marching from Siberia. It looked as if the Bolsheviks were, were about to fall, but that was not to be. So the Cossacks formed the backbone of the white resistance to the Bolsheviks. And when they lost, there was an embarrassing and soul searching moment of getting on boats and experiencing defeat. And so what I'm showing is an image of the evacuation uh, in 1920, I believe this is Novorossiysk, but it could equally substitute for the evacuations from Crimea. So large numbers of Cossacks who had fought in the white armies ended up on the coastline fighting for spaces on a small number of boats that were about to depart before those territories fell to the Soviets. Um, something in the neighborhood of 100,000 managed to get out, 98% of them men. So these were fighting units whose wives were at home. 100,000 men suddenly who have to leave their families behind, suddenly men without a country. Um, and also the, you could still meet people in the 1990s who'd lived through this. And there were a wonderful series of anecdotes uh, apt for our own moment in history as well. Don't worry, the boat is coming. Don't worry, the boat is coming. Uh, kind of like Saigon and uh, Kabul today, that this sort of moment of crushing defeat and moment in which the enemy is closing in. Um, and so these boats were a lifeline. And so nearly 100,000, the estimates range. Um, it depends on how exactly you count of service or not, but something between 50 and 100,000 Cossacks managed to get out in 1920 and managed to establish communities in, of, abroad, primarily in the Balkan countries. Bulgaria had a large contingent. Serbia had a large contingent. Um, Czechoslovakia had a large contingent. Increasingly, France had a large contingent. So it's the beginning of a Cossack immigration. I'll say only a little bit about that Cossack immigration. And here's another beautiful item from the collection. It's, it's a group of, of uh, Cossacks from the uh, Ruski Obshevolinsky Soyuz, a kind of military organization to try to keep these warriors together abroad for the purposes of fighting and returning if necessary. This is an image from 1923, I believe taken in Serbia. Uh, there was no caption with the photograph, but based on the geography in the background, I think it's Serbia. Uh, I believe in the middle that's General Vrangel who led the unsuccessful fight for Crimea and then evacuated together with his soldiers to Constantinople. Um, and we get another similar version here, a uh, slightly uh, later date, uh, also somewhere in the Balkans, also mid twenties, uh, but, but trying to keep these groups together as a fighting force. And this is how they would have liked to have been remembered. Uh, many of them had day jobs, day jobs as miners, day job as agricultural laborers, day job as factory workers and bricklayers, but on occasions of mobilization, they would come together to, to, to retain their mobile spirit and, and try to remember who they once were. So it's the beginning of the long story of the Cossack immigration, uh, which after World War II would, would increasingly bring large numbers of Cossacks to the United States. Um, in the 20s, the, the Cossack size of the Cossack immigration was rather small. I estimate about 2000 uh, made it to the United States in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, after World War II, because of organized efforts of Cossack emigres, some of whom may be in the audience, uh, the numbers increased dramatically. Uh, I believe we had uh, something in the, in the neighborhood of 15 to 25,000 
Cossacks relocating from DP camps, uh, the establishing centers in uh, New Jersey in particular, in Southern California as well, and then in all the major industrial centers, Detroit, Chicago, New York, et cetera. Now, what did these Cossacks do to stay Cossacks? Obviously, you could get together a couple of times a year. Uh, you celebrated your traditions. And one way you did that was trying to maintain um, your, your culture. And for Cossacks, their culture was their riding skills, their bravery, their sporting competitions involving horsemanship and shooting. Uh, and several troops, entertainment troops of Cossacks were formed uh, starting in the interwar period and then lasting uh, the, the last of them folded, I believe, uh, after the 1950s. Um, so they, they formed entertainment troops in order to popularize and commercialize their military skills as a kind of performance, a thrilling, daring performance of, of uh, acrobatic feats on horseback. Um, and you can see two examples here. So trick riding skills, uh, every possible uh, way of maneuvering one's body on horseback while the horse is moving, shooting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here they are performing acrobatics on a skyscraper in the, the central New York in Manhattan. And I think you can see a, a skyscraper going up behind them. So there's a wonderful collection of these photos uh, that reached the museum uh, via Sergei uh, Pratsenko, who was one of this troop. Uh, so that's one of the ways they, they preserve their culture or the memory and visibility of their culture. Another way was by becoming Indians. Now, I don't mean this in a literal sense. I mean, going to Hollywood and serving as extras in movies that required individuals with writing skills. So this is actually a, a, a photo from the museum's collection of a group of Cossacks posing as Indians, portraying Indians in a film from the 1920s. And here they are performing writing tricks on, on screen. Uh, I'm coming to a conclusion. I know I'm at the end of my time, just a couple more images. So here's that image from the film, The Cossacks, 1928. Um, I believe it might be available on Prime Video. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, I believe the film still exists. These are stills that are in the museum's collection. So here they're displaying trick writing. They're also recreating moments in Cossack culture on film. And so that takes us back to the beginning of the lecture. Here is Pratsenko and a group of other Cossacks portraying that earliest era of Zaporozhian Cossacks, those 16th, 17th century brave fighting Cossacks of a military brotherhood. And here's um, a Cossack, 20th century Cossack in the role of thinking. I only wonder what's going on his, in his mind as he's representing his culture on film for a foreign audience, disconnected from his homeland, experienced all of the hardships of, of immigration. I found this photo a really poignant follow photo. If only we could get into his head and figure out what he's thinking at that moment. Um, probably something nostalgic, uh, probably something uh, about loss, probably something about people left behind, probably something about a lost world. So I'll simply end with those words. Thank you for your attention today, and I look forward to questions. Brian, thank you so much for a, pre a phenomenal presentation. Uh, it was, I was wondering how you would be able to encapsulate the history of Cossacks in just one hour. And um, golly, you've, you've actually done it. Uh, this is a, a, a fantastic lecture that really um, brings this interesting group of, of people to, to life. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, now, as Brian takes a bit of a break um, in preparation for our question and answer session, um, I wanted to make a couple of announcements about upcoming programs. Um, so first of all, uh, in case you would like to share this lecture, which uh, has been recorded or other lectures, please go to our YouTube channel. Uh, this lecture will be uh, uploaded uh, next week. Um, and I wanted to uh, also mention the fact that we have 4,000 subscribers as of last week and over 370,000 views on our YouTube channel. So all of our past lectures um, have been posted there. So please share with your friends and please subscribe. Um, as for upcoming events, um, <clears throat> we have a live stream coming up on Tuesday, August 24th 
at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. And this is a continuation sort of inspired by uh, the exhibition in Sarske Silo. Our curator, Nick Nicholson, accompanied the objects that we sent there uh, to formally hand them over and as a courier to make sure that they were installed properly. And um, as some of you probably know, the Alexander Palace in Sarske Silo has recently undergone a restoration and just opened to the public. And Nick had the opportunity uh, to see and tour the Alexander Palace uh, just before it opened. So he has some fantastic photos that he's going to be sharing with us uh, in a conversation between me and him, um, which is going to take place on YouTube Live and Zoom again, August 24th, 2021 at 1230. And the title is The Private World of Nicholas and Alexandra, the restoration of the Alexander Palace and the Russian History Museum collection. So we'll be talking about some of the objects that relate to the Alexander Palace in our collection. Uh, the information will be available on our, on our website um, early next week, and we will provide a link to the registration form in our follow-up email to all of you. Then another announcement, um, our September lecture is, uh, second Saturday lecture is actually gonna be on the third Saturday of September. Um, this is in solemn recognition of the 20th anniversary of the events of September 11th. So the second Saturday falls on September 11th. So we will be postponing our second Saturday lecture event to the 18th. So please keep that in mind. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, if you have found Brian's uh, presentation fascinating, his books are equally fascinating. Um, I can attest myself I've read his book about Sholokhov, that was my beach reading a couple of years ago, and a fascinating glimpse into the life of this controversial um, author. So Brian's uh, books are available online. We'll drop a link into the chat box so you can go and check those out, and I highly recommend that you do. Uh, a last reminder that we do have the donation link in our uh, chat box. So if you would, if you enjoy this lecture, if you would like to support uh, these kinds of programs, please uh, go and make a donation, whatever it is, it really helps us out. So thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. And again, thank you, Brian, for a fantastic lecture. And I wish you all the best in your research um, for your forthcoming book. And maybe you could share a bit uh, with us later on if there's time about what you're researching right now. So now Hannah will take over and uh, present some of the questions that, uh, that you have hopefully been asking as I've been uh, speaking. So take care, thank you. All right, fantastic. So a few questions to get us going here. Uh, what I'm going to do for the first inquiry is actually combine two questions uh, from our attendees, Alex and Elena. Uh, Alex asks, what was the role of Cossack women and children? And Elena asks, did any of the Cossack wives ever join their husbands in emigration? Very nice question. Um, for the early period, the, the sources are quite skewed. Um, the, the early sources tell us that the, the Cossacks permitted no women in their communities. Now, that, that almost cannot be, but we start to get increasingly uh, references to women uh, in the 17th century. So early on, they were, they were a strict military brotherhood of males. In the 17th century, we start to get references to women. Um, these were uh, either captive women, so individual women who came into the community through raiding, um, I don't envy their position, or women who agreed to be kidnapped from Russian uh, districts. That is, they were married illegally under the, uh, the, under the laws of the empire and who left and abandoned their families to go home and become Cossack wives. So we, we know that, that, that starting in the 17th century, gender ratios start to even out and there are large numbers of women in, women in the community. Um, the women uh, transmitted their Cossack status to their progeny, so that there is a kind of emerging legal category of Cossack woman or Cossack wife. Um, obviously, their, their role is, is not one to take part directly in battle, although there were one or two cases, um, the, the Siege of Azov, um, in which uh, women probably actually took part in the actual fighting in, 16, in the early 1640s. Um, beyond that, the, the, the kind of best uh, representation or kind of most easily representation of Cossack women, uh, read Quiet Close the Dawn. You'll, you'll find some wonderful portraits of Cossack women there. And since um, my second book was about the 
author of that book, um, I, I, I would recommend it if you're interested in Cossack women. Unfortunately, the, the sources are skewed towards male um, Cossacks, uh, but we know that women played a vital role in regeneration of the community, in wartime, taking on the functions of men who were often absent. And because in this community, men were often away for long periods of time, women stepped up and occupied all sorts of roles uh, in the household and on the farm. And so they, they, they had a reputation of being stronger and more headstrong than, than women in general in Russia during that period. Uh, in terms of the, the immigration, it, it, it's highly complicated. Um, generally, the Soviets didn't allow women who were left behind to uh, have exit visas to join their husbands. So many of the women um, who were left behind uh, sought divorces through the Soviet system, which became more common. Um, some of them, in, everyone imagined in 1920 that the Bolsheviks would fall in a number of months. No one could envision that the regime would last for 70 years. And so many bided their time until the mid twenties, but on the, on the local level, I, I think everyone realizes by the mid twenties that the Bolshevik regime is not gonna fall. And most of these men abroad started new lives and most of these women at home started new lives. Although I've gathered a number of poignant stories um, about individuals who went back during World War II to trying to find their lost families. So when, when Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union and Cossack territories fell under German occupation, uh, some went back to find their families. They weren't always successful, uh, but, but those who did make it out tended to make it out um, in 45. So during the last stages of World War II with departing German armies. So it, it's a complicated story there. But excellent question. And you know, if, if, if your grandmother was that woman and her diary is, is available, donate it to the Russian History Museum so we can have a more definite answer in the future. Wonderful, thank you. So a few more questions here as related to uh, the fate of the Cossacks. Richard asks, what was the fate of the Cossacks who remained in Russia during the Soviet era? And if you'll excuse me, uh, another relevant question. Uh, are the self-identified Cossacks in Russia today Cossacks or isn't it, it excuse me, an idealization of pre-revolutionary war? Or yeah, those war, are two, two, two diametrically different questions. Sure. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll go with the first question. Um, what happened to the Cossacks who stayed home? And, and my, you know, one word, characterize their fate in one word, unenviable. That is, um, those left behind um, generally had a very hard time. However, and there are a number of howevers here, um, Realizing the, the, the military value of the Cossacks almost immediately in 1920, those who were left behind at the piers, so that photo I showed of people crashing forward trying to get on the boat, those who were left behind at Novorossiysk and at Fyodosia and Sevastopol in 1920 in Crimea, uh, they were sent to filtration camps and those who were not officers and those who were not heavily involved with uh, anti-Soviet propaganda were given an opportunity to join Red Army units. So some of those Cossacks who were left behind actually fought in the Red Army in the last stages of the Civil War and during the Russo-Polish War. So there, there were Cossack units created among the men left behind. Um, by the time that, that the Soviets take over, uh, that the Cossack areas had raised the greatest resistance. And so there was a kind of occupation regime in place uh, from 1920 uh, to um, about 25, in which they realized that by oppressing the Cossacks, they're depriving themselves both of agricultural economic efficiency. These tend to be some of the best, most efficient agricultural producers, as well as military manpower. So um, 1920 to 25 is very bad. You, you, a lot of people burn their family pictures, burn their uniforms, tried to erase any memory of belonging to the Cossack military caste. After 1925, um, the situation eases. Uh, and then after that, um, the policy is in, in, in private, you can talk about Cossack matters, 
just uh, don't bring it out in the public sphere. Don't, don't, don't try to remember the old times. Don't try to celebrate the old times. Try to craft some kind of present Soviet everyday Cossack form of living. So um, it's a variegated picture. I would say I'm estimating based on, on travels in Southern Russia in the 1990s, uh, at least half of the descendants of Cossacks retain some form of Cossack identity as a primary identity, which is pretty good considering the oppression that they went through. Uh, the other half moved to the city, got factory jobs, got educations, kind of left it behind. Some of those people, and now I'm segueing to the second question, suddenly started remembering in the 1990s. So when the Soviet Union went away in 1991, stuff started coming out of trunks and people suddenly remembered this Cossack heritage that they um, put away, set aside, turned their backs on, rejected, suppressed, performed in private. Know that I'm giving many different options there. Um, and so uh, it came out in the open again in the late eighties. Uh, there was an organized attempt to create a Cossack mo movement I think the fact that I said attempt says everything that I think about it. They were trying to craft continuity with the imperial era while living with the daydreams of late Soviet people. And so um, are the Cossacks who proclaim themselves Cossacks after the fall of the Soviet Union, real Cossacks, you know, the, the, the most people in the region don't believe so, and yet the Russian government is willing to embrace the idea of a revived Cossackdom with a very selected series of constructed, selected memories. Um, so to get to the second question, it depends. It depends. The, 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 the continuities were in many cases broken. People were reviving based upon an odd idiosyncratic mix of books that got republished in the early 1990s. Uh, it was a kind of bricolage of different memories and different texts and current 20th, late 20th century aspirations. Um, so in their own eyes, people who joined the real Cossack movement are definitely real Cossacks. They're invested in it. It means something to them. They've woven it into their lives in meaningful ways. Uh, in terms of the, the broad public or the broadest group of potential claimants of a Cossack identity or descendants of Imperial Cossacks, uh, there's a lot of skepticism around. So I, I think one could craft the answer both ways. They included questions in the census, the last two censuses, and the, the numbers are a fraction of what they would be. So uh, only let's say one in 10 or one in seven of individuals who could claim a Cossack identity have actually done so in the census. Thank you. So two individuals in the audience have brought up the Don Cossack choir. Uh, Nikolai writes, at least in Europe, the image of the local population about Cossacks has been formed by the Don Cossack choir in the US as well. Uh, and another anonymous attendee asks, was the Don Cossack chorus uh, that toured the USA, a bit of a cultural outreach from the USSR, or was there a musical facet of Cossack culture? So just a moment uh, spent on the Don Cossack choir. Yeah, um, I'll start with a big sigh. <sighs> Someone in the late 90s obtained the archive of Serge Jarov, the founder of the choir, consisting of dozens and dozens of boxes of records related to the choir and sold them at a New Jersey flea market. The collection was, out, was sold off piece by piece on eBay between 1997 and about 2004. I don't know who bought it, but it was partialed off and sold. So the full story of the, the Cossack Choir as a kind of cultural ambassador for lost people, I hope is not lost, I hope some Soul bought all those materials and did something with them. But unfortunately, that's one of the greatest tragedies of my career, watching, watching that stuff go and not being able to find a place for it, at least in the, in the scholarly world. Um, I've read a little bit about it. Um, I think the Jarov Choir 
wanted to be ambassadors for Cossack culture. I think they also wanted to survive in kind of interwar Europe and, and rousing singing and dance numbers, drawing upon a deep performance tradition. So not just religious songs and sacred songs that are kind of common to all of Imperial Russia that became part of their itinerary. Uh, Cossack military songs, which have a deep local tradition became a part of their itinerary. And then I think on occasion, they also sang kind of late 19th century um, hits, kind of cabaret hits as well. So um, they, they well into the 20th century and, and, and someone in the audience may correct me as, as I'm wrong, they gave performances at least into the 60s. And some of their descendants gave performances in Germany as a kind of diff, under a different name. Uh, there may be a Cossack choir even to today. So it, it kind of had a long, story, but yeah, that, that I'm going to begin what I answer with a sigh and I'm going to end with a, ah, I don't know what happened. All right, so jumping back in time a little bit here, uh, two individuals in our audience, uh, Conrad and Baba, ask about Napoleon's estimation of the Cossacks and their bravery. Hmm. All I can say is it was high. Um, I don't have the facts at immediate command. I remember reading somewhere that Napoleon um, had a very high estimation of the Cossacks, particularly at that last European stage of the war. So their role in, uh, in battles that took place in Germany, crucial battles such as the one in Leipzig that I mentioned. Um, that's all that I've personally encountered. Um, I, I haven't haven't dug into the French side too much because the, 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 the French side of the narrative gets too much play. Oh, old man, winter defeated us. It wasn't the Russians. No, that's not true. So I, I have particularly avoided the French side of the battle for most of my, my scholarly career. But um, I, I, I'm almost certain there's something about that. Uh, and obviously several of the most prominent uh, Cossack figures emerged during that war. So Ataman Platov, the raids that he led, the kind of frontal charges, the brave attacks behind the French rear, um, that the Cossacks kind of made their name as a national military mark in those battles. But no, I don't, I don't know exactly what Napoleon said, but I know, I recall reading somewhere that was very high and there were a couple of cases where he says something like the Cossacks made the difference or that the the kind of disregard for death and bravery that they showed sent our army in a, in a flight. So it wasn't, it, it, it was kind of their image and reputation that was part of it, but that's not an exact quote. That's a kind of distant memory. Thank you again. Uh, Tony asks, what can you say about the Cossacks who fought for the Reds as depicted by Isaac Babel in Red Calvary and 1920 Diary? Yeah, um, interesting book. Uh, Babel is another one of these figures that had a man crush on Cossacks. Uh, it, it comes out much more in his diary than in the, the Konarmia stories. Um, we, we know, so there's more to the story than one can find in Babel, but to find that story, one has to kind of take a deep dive into sources from the Russian side. But I will say that in the, in the last couple of years, um, some memoir-like texts created by those red Cossacks have become available and they're very interesting. So these were individuals who were given a choice, fight for the red army or die. Uh, they decide it's much better to fight for the red army. They're almost immediately sent to Poland so they can embrace some kind of idea that this is rebuilding a Russia, not the Russia that they knew. Um, they, they fight uh, under duress, so the, 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 the units have commissars which have shoot to kill orders. So it's, it's not a free situation, it's a very constrained situation. Uh, we know that many of them escaped. And in fact, the, the beginnings of a Cossack community in Poland in the interwar period come from people, from, from members of these red units who switched sides during the Russo-Polish War uh, in 1921. Uh, there were actually a couple of Cossack units that, that were commissioned within the Polish army. The Poles eventually decide that, that they can't be 100% certain about reliability, but there's a large 
interesting and complicated story there uh, that goes far beyond what Bible tells about. However, if you want a good read, um, Bible stories are quite interesting. Uh, it's, it's a particular take. Uh, Bible, uh, both given his cultural position as well as his um, kind of man of the pen versus man of the sword perspective, but I, uh, I haven't thought about Bible in a while, so I thank the question, uh, the, the, the person who asked the question for reminding me about that. All right, uh, another little bit of a jump here in time. Uh, how important was the role of the Cossacks during the Great Game? Did they accomplish something, meaning getting rid of the British? Interesting. Um, the great game that never was, I think, is the more interesting part. Uh, so when Paul sends them um, on the Persian expedition uh, on its way to India, or so we think, and the British believe in the idea that there are all these Cossacks about to be deployed near their stomping grounds, I think it, it had more, as an idea, it was more potent than it actually was. Uh, in the great, great game itself, I'm not certain strategically whether the role was that great, but I think in terms of the, the, the idea of it was certainly there. Um, there were a couple of Cossack hosts founded in uh, Central Asia, so the, the areas that today form uh, Kazakhstan, uh, certain parts of Kazakhstan, and so they certainly were approaching that area, but, it, but in terms of the actual movement into Central Asia, I'm not certain that, that because of the local conditions, they were able to play uh, an, an inordinate role. But I, I think they're part of the story. So I guess my answer would be a little bit equivocal there. All right, so just to remind our audience, we are running a bit low on time, but we do maintain a log of these Q&A inquiries. So if we have not gotten to your specific inquiry yet, uh, we maintain a log, we will have that information in our records. Uh, so have no fear there. Um, so I will leave things off here with a final question from uh, an audience member who asks about the Cossack Museum in France. Uh, which we were actually discussing a little bit before the lecture went live. So if you would like to conclude on that note. Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know the current conditions there, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, the, some of the best collections were in France. I've never been able to per personally visit them. We were talking just before this about the uh, uh, His Majesty's own uh, Imperial Escort, which, which there was a museum uh, just outside of Paris that has the the probably the most comprehensive and fascinating collection uh, about the escort. Uh, and I got the good news that it's, it's, it's uh, activities are being revived. So um, I think that's good news. Um, some of the best things are in museums that aren't always open to the public or that, that, that are owned or curated by organizations and their members. Um, I'll put out a plug for the Cossack Museum in uh, New Jersey, the Kuban Cossack Museum, which, which um, had a, a, a very, very interesting collection uh, and, and is worth a visit by anyone who's in that area. But there, there are a number of collections out there. Not all of them show up on Google with convenient hours and, and you know, open every day, uh, alas. But the Russian History Museum is open. Uh, and, and there may be more to say about Cossacks at some future point. All right, wonderful. Uh, so thank you again, Brian, for answering our audience's questions and for a fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you to all audience members who have joined us for this, as well as past and potential future Second Saturday lectures. Uh, we will be in touch within the week. Uh, we will give to you all access to the edited recording, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your time, wherever you are at today. Uh, so goodbye, everyone. May I say thank you as well. Thank you to everyone who attended. And thank you to Michael for such a generous introduction. I truly appreciated it. And I enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you today.